do today. They tended to arrange events thematically rather than chronologically, and they tended to uh, state lengths of time using numerology rather than strict calendars and clocks. They also didn't view the physical world as we view it today. They believed that the world began as a dark, watery chaos and became a flat earth and a solid dome sky. Now, that idea sounds very strange to our modern years, but they believed the sky was actually solid and holding up an ocean of water above the sky. That's where rain comes from. So this same picture appears in Genesis 1. The earth began, formless and void. Darkness was over the waters. On day one, God separates light from dark. On day two, God separates water below from water above with that solid dome firmament. And on day three, God separates the chaotic waters from the dry land. On days four, five, and six, God fills each of those spaces with motion and life. This view of the physical world appears throughout the Old Testament. And it does so because it was the common view in the ancient Near East. When God inspired Genesis 1, he accommodated his message to the people's understanding of the physical world. He didn't even try to explain to them that the earth was spherical and the sky was actually a gaseous atmosphere. This idea of accommodation was actually suggested well before modern science. In 1563, John Calvin wrote in his commentaries on the book of Genesis, that Genesis states those things which are everywhere observed, even by the uncultivated, and which are in common use. God revealed himself in terms that everyday people could understand, which is a comforting thought. We don't have to understand science to read Genesis. Genesis 1 does, however, have some striking differences with the creation stories of Egypt and Babylon. This Egyptian engraving shows the firmament, but now it's the sky goddess not there, and the, you can see with all the stars on her body. Uh, there's still the flat earth, but it's the earth god here. There's the sun, but it's here as a sun god. In fact, there's gods in every part of this drawing. The Babylonian story is also filled with gods battling over the formation of the world, and the losing god gets made into the solid firmament. So imagine you were an Israelite, hearing Genesis 1 for the first time. You would have hardly noticed physical structures like the firmament, because everyone knows that. But you would have been captivated by the idea that the God of Israel is the only God in the story. The other gods are missing. The sun is not the powerful Egyptian sun god, Ra, but merely a greater light, a physical object made by Israel's God. So the primary message to the ancient Hebrews wasn't about the, uh, was, sorry, wasn't about the how and the when, it was about the who and why of creation, that Israel's God is the sovereign creator of all, and humans are very good, made in his image. If God's purposes in Genesis 1 didn't include teaching scientific information to the Israelites, such as that the sky isn't solid, then we too shouldn't look there for scientific information about the age of the earth or the formation of species. Okay, much more could be said about interpretation of Genesis, and not all Christians agree that this interpretation is the best. Uh, for more, uh, we recommend uh, a book by Gordon Glover, uh, Beyond the Ferment, and an article by Dan Harlow, Creation According to Genesis. But if this interpretation is correct in terms of ancient Near East cosmology, it means that Genesis 1 isn't going to teach us the how and the when. So we turn to God's other revelation, nature itself, which gives abundant evidence about the history of the universe. So the age of the universe was hotly debated by astronomers in the 20th century. They weren't debating thousands of years versus billions. They were debating billions of years versus infinitely old. And they did so uh, partly because the idea of a beginning sounded too religious. So if it was infinitely old, then there was no beginning. By the 1920s, astronomers knew that the galaxies are moving apart from each other. There they go, moving apart from each other, being pulled along with the expansion of the fabric of space itself. By the way, these beautiful images were all made by Calvin students with our own telescope. Now, imagine the expansion rewound backwards, extrapolating back in time. The galaxies would have been closer together in the past. And if we continue that extrapolation, the galaxies would have all been on top of each other, and the atoms would have get all packed together in a hot, dense state. Astronomers calculate that this state would have occurred 13.7 billion years ago, and that would be the age of the whole universe itself. Like all good scientific models, this model for the history of the universe is not just an extrapolation, it makes testable predictions. One prediction is that we should still be able to see the heat radiation from that early time. That prediction was confirmed in 1965 when Penzias and Wilson discovered the heat radiation of the universe itself. 
That finally convinced astronomers that the universe was not infinitely old, even those who didn't like the idea of a beginning. This scientific model is called the Big Bang. Now, that term has a bad reputation in some Christian circles because some atheists have used Big Bang as a replacement for God. These atheists have put their own worldview spin on a valid scientific result. They've said, we can explain the history of the universe scientifically, so there must not be a God. Well, that's a lot like saying, we can explain rain clouds scientifically, so there must not be a God. A scientific explanation does not replace God. We hear both atheists and Christians making this error all the time. Beware of it. We believe God used the process of the Big Bang, a hot beginning in an expanding universe, to make the atoms and the galaxies and eventually the sun and the earth. Okay, I'll turn it over to Lauren to tackle the issues of evolution and human origins. Over the years, I've heard a number of people say, I'm okay with an old earth, but I don't believe in evolution. Now, if somebody says that to you, or if they say evolution is a scientifically proven fact, I recommend that you ask them, what do you mean by evolution? Because that word means different things to different people. Often it's used equivalent to atheism. Just as some people take the scientific model of the Big Bang and add an atheistic spin, so some people do with evolution. For example, uh, in an essay about evolution, biologist Stephen Jay Gould once wrote, no intervening spirit watches lovingly over the affairs of nature, and whatever we think of God, his existence is not manifest in the products of nature. Now that's not really a scientific theory, that's a worldview belief. When the theory of evolution is used to support atheism, it's often called evolutionism. You can find many examples in popular books and media stories, and like all Christians, we disagree with evolutionism. But scientists often use the word evolution in other ways which are more technically scientific. Microevolution refers to small changes in species caused by random mutations in DNA and reproductive success accumulating over a few decades or centuries. Most genetic mutations have little effect, some mutations are harmful, and depending on the environment, some mutations help individuals live longer and have more offspring. That's what we mean by reproductive success. Genes with beneficial mutations become more common in later generations. Microevolution allows species to adapt to changing environments and sometimes to split into two or more species. You all know about brown bears and polar bears whose fur colors are adapted to their environments, but there are many more examples. One well-studied example is the cichlid fish of Africa. 3,700 years ago, a sandbar cut off part of Lake Victoria, creating Lake Nabugabo and isolating some cichlid fish from their parent stock. In just that short time, 3,700 years, they evolved and split into five new species, which no longer interbreed. In our opinion, microevolution is a marvelous process which God created allowing species to survive and thrive in new or changing environments. Sometimes the word evolution is used to refer to the pattern of change that we see in the fossil record. Uh, this slide shows one example. Modern whale fossils are at the bottom, and as you go towards the top of the slide, you see prog uh, progressively older fossils that look progressively less like modern whales. This sort of pattern is everywhere in the fossil record. Modern plants and animals look somewhat like fossils that are 40 million years old, less like fossils that are 60 million years old, and so forth. Going back further in time, the oldest land animals are fossils that are 380 million years old, and the oldest fish are 520 million years old. This pattern of change is found all over the world. It's right there in the rocks. But what does it mean? That brings us to the next definition. Common ancestry refers to the idea that all species are linked into a kind of family tree. Modern dogs and coyotes and wolves are all descended from a common ancestral wolf-like species that no longer exists. Similarly, all dogs and cats and other mammals are descended from a common ancestor even longer ago. Common ancestry fits the pattern we see in the fossil record, but it doesn't tell us the mechanism of how species change and split over time. And that brings us to the fifth definition. The theory of evolution refers to a modern version of Charles Darwin's theory. It states that random mutations and reproductive success not only produce small changes over a few centuries, like those cichlid fish I mentioned, but also produce large changes over millions of years. 
All plants and animals are descended from common ancestor, and the 